Welcome to episode 283 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to, once again, retired agents Phil Torsney and Tommy McDonald, who, in part two of this two-part episode, review how, during the unresolved fugitive investigation of James Whitey Bolger, they altered their investigative strategy by focusing a national media campaign, including a 30-second public service announcement, on photos they had acquired of Bolger's female companion, Catherine Gregg. Bolger had served as an informant for the FBI for several years. His FBI agent handler, John Connolly, was charged and convicted for revealing to Bolger that he was about to be indicted for RICO by the Massachusetts State Police and the Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA. Federal prosecutors later filed a superseding indictment and, in addition to the initial racketeering charges, tried and convicted Bolger for 19 murders. Phil and Tommy gathered the evidence that finally led to the dramatic capture of Bolger and Greg by agent Scott Gariola in the L.A. division. Now, I'm not going to read Tommy and Phil's bio again, But I want to remind you that after working the Bolger case as a special assignment during the last two years of his FBI career, Phil Torsney was actually transferred from the Cleveland Division to the Boston Field Office to coordinate the investigative efforts that resulted in the apprehension of Whitey Bolger. And Tommy, after working in Boston on the fugitive case as a special assignment from the New York office, later accepted a transfer to the Boston Division. Throughout both episodes, Phil and Tommy have acknowledged the many agents and FBI staff, as well as other law enforcement agencies, who worked for many years trying to find Whitey Bulger. Phil and Tommy were the fortunate ones who found the lead that cracked the case. Now, I've heard from several listeners who want to hear more about the John Connolly investigation. So I've been in touch and I'm hoping to have the case agents from that investigation on FBI Retired Case File Review in the next few months. So stay tuned. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com. You'll also find links to where you can buy me a cup of coffee, join my reader team, and learn more about me and my books. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. We're back for part two of the case review about the hunt for top 10 fugitive Whitey Bolger with the retired agents Phil Torsney and Tommy McDonald. During part one of the case review, we stopped just when you were telling us about a unique investigative lead, Whitey Bolger's girlfriend, Catherine Gregg's breast implants. So let's pick up at the point where your search for her medical records develops into a major breakthrough in your hunt to locate and apprehend her and Whitey Bolger. Tommy, why don't you start where we left off? So we had this conversation over breakfast. Could she be a Jane Doe somewhere in the United States listed in CODIS or NCIC? We had both heard in the case that there was information that she had received breast implants And we had both worked missing child cases, and we were somewhat familiar with CODIS and DNA and databases and things such as that. We decided, let's see if we can look into that more. Let's see if we can find any breast implant serial numbers for Kath and Greg so that if she had been found as a murdered Jane Doe and some medical examiner had done an autopsy, he may have gone in and removed those implants and listed that serial number on a report, and that would take us closer to our fugitive. So that's, in fact, what we did. We had developed a contact off the pen register, someone we had spoken to a few times. That person had provided us with information that Miss Gregg had been driven to a plastic surgery appointment at Newton Wellesley Hospital in Boston, which was new information for the investigation. 
In early December 2009, Phil and I went to serve a subpoena at Newton Wellesley Hospital. That's about 12 miles from the Boston Field Office, which is over at One Center Plaza. Big case, right? You go there in person, you serve the subpoena in person. So we serve the subpoena. We get one return that in December of 1985, Miss Gregg had received plastic surgery inpatient at the hospital. However, it had nothing to do with breast surgery. It was a strikeout, right? But it was something. It was new information to the case. So made the decision like, okay, maybe the procedure for her breasts had been done outpatient in an office. So decided to serve a subpoena on the doctor who was on the medical records as doing the inpatient procedure. His name was Dr. Eugene Cordes. He was a very well-known plastic surgeon in Boston. And unfortunately, he died of melanoma in 2000. So it's another dead end. I'll use a basketball analogy, just as like a half court shot at the end of the half. I got a subpoena for the doctor who took over Dr. Cordes's practice. This is like a great story for investigators, whether they're FBI or cops or anything. You never know that one more subpoena might be the case breaker. So I went and served the subpoena in person on Dr. Matthias Donlin. And he was the doctor that took over Dr. Cordes's practice in Newton Wellesley Hospital. Any guess, Jerry, what Dr. Donlin's father did for a living? No guess. (laughs) It was FBI Special Agent Charlie Donlin. He served in the FBI. Are you serious? Yeah, he served in the FBI for over 25 years. Dr. Donlin had been a practicing plastic surgeon. He still practices in Boston, but he had been in Boston seeing patients for years. And him and his family were very proud of the fact that their dad was an agent. And they lived the FBI life. I believe his father retired in the early 70s, Charlie Donlin, and he retired. He was teaching at Quantico. He had been down working with Director Hoover. I think he was an attorney. That was kind of a neat. And it's always nice when you serve a subpoena to have someone that's supporting you and trying to help you at the other end of the subpoena rather than some records person that could care less about the case. Dr. Donlin had a lot of bad feelings towards the press in Boston. He felt that the FBI had been unfairly portrayed in this whole Bolger case. And here, sure enough, he's getting a subpoena from an FBI agent asking for records. I believe he had no recollection that Dr. Curtis had treated Bolger's girl on the side back in the day. That was the end of December, right before Christmas. I remember Phil had gone back to Cleveland and it was kind of rolling into the holidays. I think I served a subpoena right before New Year's weekend. I get a call two weeks later from Dr. Donlin and he says, yeah, you're not going to believe this, but we located a box in storage in the basement of the office here. And there had been a box set aside for patients that had received certain breast implants back in the 70s and 80s. Some of these implants had exploded and women had actually died. So these records were preserved for litigation, one of which was a file for Catherine Gregg. He told me, yeah, we have her serial number for her breast implants. It was like, boom, we got what we wanted. I remember just as an afterthought on the phone, he says to me, Tommy, do you want the photos too? I really didn't even know at the time what he meant. I've never had plastic surgery. I've never really been involved with it. I didn't know they take really good before and after photographs before a procedure. Knowing the Bolger case, knowing that the best photos we ever had of Kathy Gregg were a grainy passport photo for her and a photo of her sitting on a couch with her two dogs and maybe then a yearbook photo. Like We never had a criminal history photo of her. We never had a driver's license photo for her. The licenses weren't digitalized in Massachusetts till several years after they went on the run. Kathy Gregg grew up kind of like we grew up, not like the kids nowadays. I see my kids taking photos of themselves several times a day. It drives you nuts. This is pre-Facebook, pre-Instagram. We had no good photos of this fugitive we were looking for, and Dr. Donlin did. How old were those photos at the time? I can only speak to what's public about this because these are private records related to Miss Gregg. So I can only speak about what we've been authorized to speak about. But she had several plastic surgery procedures from June of 82 to August of 92. For a 10-year period while she's Bolger's girlfriend on the side, she saw Dr. Cordes and she would pay him cash. And her first visit to him was in June of 82. She paid $4,000 in cash and received implants made by a company called Surgitech, which was based out of Wisconsin and later purchased by Bristol Myers Squibb. That's where we got the serial number from those records. And unfortunately, I had reached out for Phil. He was a big NCIC. He had done a lot of work with CGIS and, and NCIC in his career. And he said, let me call my contact down there and see if we can get the record and see if there's a hit. And unfortunately, there was not any. But really, the ticket out of this subpoena process was the new photographs we now had for Kathy Gregg. 
the most recent of the photos were she had a pre-operative appointment in August of 92, Jerry. This is close to about two years before she left, two and a half years before she became a fugitive. She had an appointment to get what's called an autoplasty, which is getting your ears sewn back. And those are really good photographs of her taken in that pre-operative appointment with really good face shots of her. It's amazing, like looking for a fugitive, like one thing's technology has really changed the world, but one thing that'll never change is having a good photograph of a fugitive. It's amazing to see that if you're going to look for really detailed photos of a person, absent maybe a modeling shoot, I can't think of any better way than for it to come from a plastic surgeon appointment. These are really pristine photos that the FBI now has a tool to try and find these fugitives. They were in the possession of the FBI less than three months after this TDY started, almost three months to the day that this TDY started in the middle of January of 2009. The most recent was in 92. So this is now 2010. When you see the before and after shots of her arrest photo, and when you put that side by side to these photos, I'm talking about the most recent photos taken, it's no doubt that a tipster saw that photo and called in in less than 24 hours of the public service announcement that went out. It's a great photo to get. And it was much better that it was photos for her than of finding photos for Bolger. We never had super photographs for Bolger either, but they were really spot on. I believe Phil actually interviewed Bolger on the flight back to Boston. Phil can talk about it later, but he said that Bolger made a statement to him. Once I saw those photographs on the news, I knew I was in trouble. All right. So you find these photographs towards the end of 2009. He's not captured. They're not captured until 2011. What did you do with those photos? It sounds like it still took a little bit of time to get her identified and them located and apprehended. Right before I get to that, when you're working cases, there's a lot of grind and not a lot of glory in the FBI. But one of the nice side stories of this case, at least for me personally, is Dr. Donlan was such a fan of the FBI. He actually agreed to operate on my daughter and another girl that I coached in basketball when I eventually moved to Maine and performed the same procedure, the autoplasty on them for free at the Shriners Hospital. So he was a true friend of the Bureau, Dr. Matthias Donlan. So we get these photos, Jerry, it's actually the middle of January, 2010, we got these photos and they were little slides. They were, I don't know, little slides, the size of a tiny school photo you might get of someone, but they were like in the slide configuration. So they were nothing like a medium that we would have nowadays. So I spent a lot of time with John Green, who was a very dedicated photographer in the Boston office. John converted these slides into usable PDFs and we started organizing the case and and we started getting these photos out. It took about one month for the U.S. Attorney's Office to give us authority to release the photographs. That kind of showed, you know, I was a little bit like, I don't mean to take shots at anyone, but one of the things that surprised me about this being in Boston, working this high profile case was just the pace of the U.S. Attorney's Office. I felt like a lot of times they were just happy indicting Bolzer and they weren't really excited about doing these new and innovative things we were trying to do to help find these fugitives. It was a bizarre feeling. I I really just, I'm speaking from the heart on it. You know, it was really weird to experience that. And I think a lot of agents in Boston who are in the grind working cases feel that way often. And it was nothing I had been used to in my career, particularly working in New York with the Eastern and Southern districts who will, they'll stay up to two o'clock writing an affidavit for you on a case. One month it took to get authority to release the photos. Why? I'm trying to figure out why you would need their authority to release a photo. They were health records privacy issues there. So it needs to be scrubbed and approved by layers of authority to release them, which I understand. I've worked cases before with health records. Yeah, it took us one month to get authority to release photos and one week to get up on a pen register. Those were responses from a prosecutor's office I had not been used to coming from New York City. I'd get up on a pen in a day in New York without having to have a meeting to explain myself about it. But you know, the guy killed 19 people. I was surprised by that response, especially in a city where they were constantly killing the FBI as not doing enough or not doing our job competently. You have an agent now who's like, hey, we got this great tool. Let's go. Let's run. And it was like, keep it in first gear and let's do it this way. That was new for me, but we grinded through it. John Green was a huge home run. We had a meeting. The case team at that point was myself. It was Rich Tehan, Christian McDowell, Bobby Hastings, our analyst, and Laura Hanlon. As I mentioned, Laura was a great agent. She caught a top 10 prior in her career, a guy named Shalachi. The consensus amongst all of us was, listen, let's not just release these photos right away. Let's get organized and let's have a process in how we're doing it. The FBI, we don't just hold press conferences the next day and release photos like police departments do. And sometimes I think they do it right by doing that. 
And sometimes I think we do it right by taking our time. But in this case, we felt like if Bolger was on the run and if he had the means to pack up and leave wherever he was, he might do that if we do a national release of the photographs in March of 2010. And it turned out to be a good call. I mean, he ended up being caught with $800,000 in his wall. So he certainly could have packed up his belongings and went to another part of the country and dropped his alias, right? We decided, what are we going to do with these photos, Jerry? Well, how are we going to exploit this new tool, this new thing we got off subpoenas? The first thing was, is Phil and I both felt very strongly that facial recognition might be the ticket on this case, that if they had been fugitives and were living in other parts of the country or other parts of the world, if we could submit photos of them through databases, we might get a hit on their new identity and be able to locate them that way. Turned out not to be the case. Bolger was too smart of a fugitive to put his face into any database, as was Miss Greg. But we thought we were going to get returns. We were sending out those plastic surgery photos. We set up a DVD that had all the key photos on it. We were sending it to all the field offices, priority lead. We all liked Canada. We were sending it to the provinces in Canada. I feel like you bat 300 with the league ads in the FBI. So I was even sending it to National Academy grads, cops from other parts of the world that were interesting locations to us who had gone through our National Academy and backdooring it. In addition to the facial recognition returns, we were hoping to get a hit somewhere throughout all the state DMV, the motor vehicle bureaus, and internationally as well. We started a plastic surgery initiative for Miss Greg, and that was in April of 2010. I spent $2,000 in case funds and came up with a campaign or a publicity thing saying, have you treated this woman? We were trying to shift the focus from him to her, from Bolger to Greg, using these photographs as the front tool. We took out this ad in the Sports Illustrated for plastic surgery offices. It's called the Plastic Surgery News. We put a full page ad with those photos in it. And we were hoping that either they would recognize Miss Greg as a patient, thinking that someone had so many procedures done pre-fugitive might still have that pattern post-fugitive. So maybe there was a chance that those implants had exploded while she was on the run and she needed to get them removed. So if there was a chance with the serial number, we might get a hit. We got about 20, 25 leads that came in that required further investigation from all our field offices. One very good lead was in Victoria, British Columbia, and that was in the middle of April 2010. I remember Phil, myself, Christian McDowell, Laura Hanlon, and Rich Tehan hopped a plane from Boston, pretty confident we were going to come back with our fugitives. We had a doctor, his wife who worked at the practice, two nurses and a receptionist all say that Miss Greg was a patient of theirs out in Victoria, British Columbia, which was an area of the world that we all liked a lot. There had been some reporting from Stephen Fleming's camp that Bolger had always talked about Vancouver. We actually had a call into one of the pens from a small town about an hour and a half north of Victoria. So we really liked that sighting and thought it was going to take us to the fugitives. And unfortunately, it did not. Was it a lookalike or somebody who they thought was Catherine Gregg and wasn't? We never found a lookalike. It was pretty much, we went through all the records and did all the interviews and we never were able to identify the person. It was a dead end lead. The next month, we did the same thing in the ADA News, which is like the main magazine journal for dentists. I spent about $11,000 in case funds to get a full page ad taken out in that publication. Miss Gregg had been a hygienist before she became this fugitive or criminal's girl on the side. In the late 70s, she had gone to Forsyth Dental School in Boston and had been a hygienist. And so we thought maybe there was a chance on the run that she'd be working at a hygienist somewhere. And we got some great leads that came in off of that. These things take time, Jerry. These leads come in from, they come into a hotline number we had established, and then you got to send the lead out to the field office and you got to get a responsible agent on the other end, which you hope happens more times than not, who's going to go out right away and cover the lead. But they have other cases going on themselves. And some of them have probably covered many Bolger leads in the past. So they've become quite cynical. That was what we were doing with these photographs. Just as an example of the grind of working cases and why sometimes things don't happen as fast as the public thinks they should, we actually found a woman named Elizabeth Gregg who lived in a small town in Texas who was a party to a class action suit for Surgitech for defective breast implants. So she had gotten the same breast implants as our fugitive, had almost the same exact name and was not our fugitive. So that took time to, I don't remember if it was the Houston or Dallas office that had to run that one down. Those are the type of things that come up when you're working these cases that take up time and energy. When you initially sent these photos as leads to all these different offices, you had said that you did so before you wanted to release them nationally. 
So I was just really curious as to what you were hoping that sending them out as leads to different field offices and to different law enforcement agencies, what you wanted them to do with those photos before you released them nationally. Facial recognition. Yeah, we wanted to get that one violent crime agent or that one analyst on a violent crime squad who had connections with task force officers that had connections with the state departments that run the motor vehicle databases and take that DV to them and say, hey, do you have facial recognition? Can you run these photos through your database? So that if Bolger and Greg had been living in Montana and had gotten the name Don Smith and Judy Smith and had gotten a Montana driver's license under those names, we would identify them through facial rec. And then when you released the photos, when you started to use the photos in ads and plastic surgery magazines, were you also releasing them nationally at that time, say, America's Most Wanted? Or were you hoping that it would stay a little bit quiet still as you put out your different leads to medical and plastic surgery Yeah, we knew when we did the publications with the Dental Association and the Plastic Surgery Association, we knew that we risked this becoming a big national story. Fortunately, it really did not kind of say it on the down low. There was a little bit of reporting on it that was favorable to the FBI, but we never released that these were new photographs, that this was something new the FBI had, which would have really been something I think people would have paid attention to. The answer is really, we were waiting for that one return from that one field office saying, hey, we think we got them. They're living under this alias. We did a facial recognition search through our state database and we nailed them. We got them. We think this is them. And there were leads coming back from these offices and these places with photos that we had to look at and say, no, that's not them. So there was a lot of work involved with all the leads that were going out and coming back in. Well, that was very patient of you to do because, as you had mentioned, the thought is you get these photos and you put them out there, and that had been happening. You had been getting inundated with all of these hundreds and thousands of leads, and by doing it slow this way, you kind of stop that floodgate, that open spigot of information from coming in and you not being able to pinpoint when it is an accurate or valid lead. Phil's going to talk a little bit later about the public service announcement that the FBI put out and all the great work that was involved in that. I was not a part of that. Phil took that over when he came back to the case. Selfishly, I wish we had released these photos sooner, or maybe I could have been at the controls when we got that tip from California saying, hey, this is Charlie and Carol Gasco, no doubt. But the decision was made by the investigative team, like we got to be smart about how we release these photos because this is a fugitive that's probably got the means to pack up and leave once he saw that hit the evening news. And certainly that ended up being true. So really the facial recognition returns was what we thought was our best shot to catch him without him hearing it from the news. It all worked out well in the end. It really did. It didn't happen as fast. A lot of people have asked us in looking at the story of how we caught Bolger, like, why didn't you release the plastic surgery photo sooner to the media? I mean, we got them in January of 2010. Bolger and Greg weren't apprehended until June of 2011. The answer is what I was just talking about, all the leads and all the creative, innovative ways we were hoping we could backdoor and get the ID. We thought if we selectively release them, kind of a backdoor way, we'd get a hit on facial recognition. We might get a lead from a plastic surgeon office or a dental office. We thought that was probably the best way to release these new photos so that our fugitive didn't pack up and leave and change his alias and go somewhere else. And I tell you, also, we're doing facial recognition. We're trying to see if one of these pictures could be on a passport as well. We're accessing different countries, State Department, that kind of thing, to see if facial recognition would help us. That took some time, no doubt about it. But if he had a passport out of the country under an assumed name, we want to know about it. Yep. And the more we did this, Jerry, the lack of returns we got, Phil and I both became confident, like, this guy's in the United States. Like, he's not overseas. There was never any evidence that he left the United States other than the sighting in London. So we felt pretty confident that he was probably still in the States. And then, like I said, the the summer of 2010, July, I was sent back to New York. And that was at the point where in order to keep the momentum in the case going, Phil came in on a professional resource list transfer at the end of his career to Boston just to work the Bolger case. Phil, would you start up in September? Yeah, September of that year, 2010. Part of this and, and another thing that took time. So we have these pictures. We have quite a few pictures pursuant to this subpoena of Catherine Gregg. You look at these pictures and it's like your old kid opening a present at Christmas. 
the focus is automatic. Why are we looking for this old man all over the place? We got to look for him to some extent, but combine these two and really switch the focus to Catherine. Because Catherine, as far as we know, is still alive, still there. We're still together. And that turned out to be the case. First thing we got to do is figure out which of these pictures are the one to use of Catherine. We did that, and I showed the picture to Bobby Hastings, some other females in the office, which one of these is the best picture. So had better lighting than others, and we did that. On all these pictures, we picked the right one. And the next thing we want to do is figure out how to get this out there. You can put these pictures out a number of ways, and one of the ways was billboards, America's Most Wanted, press release from the office, all this other computer media-generated stuff that I wasn't an expert on, never will be, but I knew people who were. And we want to use these pictures of her along with him to supplement him, to get it out every way we can think of. So I start talking to Michelle Golshin at headquarters, the media unit there back at headquarters, other people back there. There's unit chiefs and section chiefs involved. One of the Boston media folks, Kate Galata, came up with the idea, well, if we're going to do everything, let's do it right. One of the things the FBI had never done is do a public service announcement, pay for a public service announcement to actually like do almost a commercial to get something out there. We looked into that. We knew this would cost some money, but it was costing money every day to look for this guy for 16 years. We got to put this to an end before he dies, whatever happens, before we can put this thing away for good. So we got to find him sooner than later. So Kate Galata comes up with this public service announcement. We talked to headquarters. Talk to people in the know about this, people smarter than me about this, and we figure out we're going to do it all at once. We're going to do billboards. We're going to do a press conference. We're going to do this public service announcement. We take the public service announcement. We have to craft it. It's not long. It's 30 seconds. We're targeting this public service announcement toward a female audience, toward time slots where audience are watching shows like Oprah, The View, that kind of show. We can pick and choose because we're paying for it. We're not relying on the media when they want to put it up. We're paying for it. We can pick areas of the country we want it to be shown in. We're running the show. So we find a production company that somebody knew that did a great job putting this thing together. We did two separate versions. We picked the right pictures. We took this thing and put it out there. And within 24 hours, we had the tip based on her picture, really recognizing both pictures. Within 24 hours, we had a tip that looked darn good. Before we had put out the PSA in these pictures, June of 2011, a marshal from the task force, Neil Sullivan, had come on board. He'd been working the case with us. We sat in the same place every day working the case. He helped out with input on this thing. I just want to mention Neil and the Marshals were involved as well in all this. We had to pick the right time slots and all that kind of thing. So eventually, we decided we're putting this thing out on this date with a press conference, with a billboard in Times Square, numerous other billboards, and we're going to make it happen. It did happen. And part of what we figured was going to happen was the fact we had used a PSA was going to get us derivative publicity from many news outlets that the FBI had for the first time used a public service announcement. That's in fact what happened. The Wall Street Journal put out a headline about us using a public service announcement. And the headline was Wall Street Journal, June 21st, 2011. It's got Greg's pictures there, top, Whitey Bulger's pictures, a picture of them together. And it says, daytime TV's newest stars, fugitive and friend, front page of the Wall Street Journal. That's because the PSA, they're seeing the PSA and that's why it went out there like that. Do you have a link to that? I'd love to be able to include that in the show notes. I'm sure we do. Wall Street Journal, June 21st, 2011. We can figure that out. When we were planning out where to release this PSA, we had so much money from FBI headquarters. And I'll tell you, that took some work too. They were great. They gave us what we wanted, but we spent some money on media and the public service announcement. We had to get approvals from the top down there. So another factor that took electronic communications and contact with headquarters back and forth. One of the things that limited us then was funding. We wanted to get a lot of these PSAs out there in a lot of markets. LA, we didn't do too expensive. Some of these places were crazy expensive. We did Milwaukee as opposed to Chicago. We knew he'd been in Chicago, but we're not thinking he's going to be in places he had been previously. 
we didn't know for sure he had been to Los Angeles, but we knew he had been out in the Southwest. We picked some places out there. Our funds weren't unlimited. So that's where the derivative publicity comes in. We broadcasted, targeted female audiences, Dr. Oz, the view, that kind of thing, when people will be watching. The other thing we did, Jerry, is talking to FBI headquarters, the media folks. We got the FBI to authorize a $100,000 reward for Catherine Gregg's capture. There was not many females wanted by the FBI with a $100,000 reward. Bulger, of course, had a $2 million reward, but we wanted to emphasize the female part of this and Greg having a reward as well. It was unique, new, and it helped us. The other thing, we weren't sure if Greg was okay. We worked this into the public service announcement because we weren't sure. We wanted people to look at the picture of her. She's traveling with a guy who's wanted for numerous murders and possibly help us out based on the fact that Catherine Gregg may be in danger. So we emphasize that in a public service announcement. It did take a little while, but it was well thought out. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, within 24 hours of putting this out, we got the tip. And then within 48 hours, Gregg and Bulger are in custody. So I was talking about Neil Sullivan, the marshal. The night we first put this public service announcement out there and did the press conference and all that, we got a pretty good tip in Biloxi, Mississippi. Neil was fanning the phones, and it looked pretty good. I had worked one shift, you know, long shift, gone home. He was working the second shift in this command post at the Boston FBI office. He called me up, said, you better come in there. This is decent. It was Biloxi. It made sense. He had been in Grand Isle, Louisiana. We ran it out, did some things. Neil did a lot of work on that, but it was not Bulger and Gray. That was the first one, but within another day, we got the good one, and that was the one in Santa Monica. Tell us more about who called it in, who okay. was able to identify them. That's one thing we've never talked about. It was something that was in the press. I don't want to give names or specifics. I know people have done that, but I did this for so long with the FBI. First thing I told him when I was knocking on the door looking for somebody for murder or rape or armed robbery was, I'm not going to tell anybody where I got the information. I just sort of feel obligated to stay that way, even in my retirement. So I don't even want to say anything that might identify the caller from my perspective. The individual who provided the tip only saw this derivative publicity. It was publicity that was put out there through a variety of means. The tip was the individual recognized Bulger and Greg as living in a apartment in Santa Monica, California. It was the Princess Eugenia Apartments, which are in Santa Monica, just north of the main downtown area. So it was very specific. Gave an apartment number. The man and the woman commented on both looking like these people. Neil Sullivan, the marshal, took the initial call, called me again. We put our heads together. We got a potential name of the individuals living in Santa Monica, Charlie Gasco and Carol Gasco. One of the things Neil did, the marshal, right away, he took the call. He's in touch with the caller. Anytime you get a case like this, somebody's on the run, you want to check the name, you think they're on the run under. You check the name Charlie and Carol Gasco, and there's not a lot there. Neil did that. In fact, deceased doesn't seem like they're current living people. Some background that doesn't make sense, doesn't match up. Now you have a tip that not only looks good facially, you have information that the names these people are living under is bogus, not current. So that's a pretty good clue that makes the tip look excellent. Like the Biloxi tip, we didn't get that. This tip, all of a sudden, these people are using the alias of somebody who is no longer around. The wheel starts rolling. Rich Tian, who was in that evening, and myself both knew Scott Gariola, who is a legendary fugitive agent out in Los Angeles. Scott was on. We called him. Rich actually called him. He was off that day. Told him it's Whitey Bulger. Good, credible tip. We have an actual address to go to. Gave him the address, the apartment number. He gets his folks out there. Same kind of thing. Like I was on in Cleveland. It's a fugitive violent crime task force out of Los Angeles. They speak to somebody in the apartment building who helps identify a secondary individual who also identifies Bulger and Greg as living there under this alias name. Scott Gariola sets up people there. He has a surveillance on the patio coming off the apartment where the gas goes live. They're watching it. They see a female come out, appears to look like Greg, another good clue. 
they come up with a ruse where an individual calls Bolger and asks him to come down and look at a storage area in the basement to get him out of the apartment, saying his storage locker had been broken into. Dariola and two guys from Los Angeles law enforcement on his task force are in the basement. As Charlie Gasco comes down, Gasco's confronted by Gariola and the other officers on his task force. Gariola tells Bolger to get down on his knees. Bolger refuses to get down, saying there's grease on the floor. Gariola told me, he said, well, I sort of figured it was him when he's doing that. And he's got the FBI telling him to get down on his knees and point a gun at him. It's something Bolger would do. Not the typical behavior of yeah. an older gentleman. Or of an innocent gentleman when he's confronted by law enforcement and doesn't know anything about it. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, they're going to be scared. They're going to be concerned. They're going to be compliant. Right. Definitely not typical behavior. There's a little back and forth between Scott and Bulger, like you identify yourself, which Scott did, and asked Bulger to identify himself. And he first said he gave the name Charlie Gasco, and they handcuffed Gasco. He eventually admitted he was Whitey Bulger. They went back up to the apartment, arrested Catherine Gregg, searched the apartment, found a bunch of money, $800,000 in the apartment, numerous weapons, numerous pieces of false ID, numerous pieces of paperwork, sort of identifiers about different people, people he had gotten false ID from, like where they were born, their moms and dads name. Almost a study guide that Bolger had if he was confronted, he could spit some of this stuff out. A lot of books, a ledger he'd been keeping, or almost a book he talked about writing, but all kinds of stuff in there. So he's under arrest. Catherine Gregg's under arrest. They're in custody, and then there's still a lot of work to do after that. It was great that Scott Gariola was the agent on the other end of the tip in Los Angeles. And Scott is a legendary fugitive agent in the FBI. I had handled a couple of leads of his when I was working in New York City. I think I had sent a few out to him as well. It could have been a probationary agent or someone on duty or something on a case like this. You hope not. It was great that a very well-regarded, experienced, dedicated FBI agent was at the other end of this to really wrap it up. Yeah, I agree. I've had a chance to interview Scott on FBI Retired Case File Review. He was on episode 232 talking about the Chippendale case. Yeah, he's a great guy. And <laughs> he kind of teased us with the Whitey Bulger case. I'll make sure to let him know that we've done this case review and that both of you have given him glowing reviews and had a lot of nice things to say about him and dedication to hunting down fugitives. I got to hear from both of you about when you got the phone call that they had arrested him. What was that like? I'm in the command post in the Boston FBI office in the Boston division. We knew this was good. Neil Sullivan had taken the tip. Me, Tian, and Sullivan had been talking about it. We had called Gariola. We had been texting Gariola back and forth. We absolutely knew Scott's reputation and knew he was going to get it done out there and get it done right. Of course, we wanted to be there, and one of the quickest things we tried to do was get on a flight that evening to Los Angeles when we figured out the ID was really a deceased guy and was no good. But there were no more flights from L.A. to Boston that night, too late, pouring rain in Boston. I went home quickly, packed a bag because I knew we were going out the next morning, first flight. But to answer your question as to what happened, we had extra personnel in the command post. It was almost quiet because it had been so long and there had been so many ups and downs. It almost got quiet for a minute when Scott texted me. And I remember just talking to the person next to me and the other people in the room, just telling them they got him. He's in custody. And then when they got Catherine, she's in custody. It wasn't like a great surprise, but it's a relief and it's ending to a lot of hard work with a good logical conclusion, a lot of hard work by a lot of good people and putting a lid on a lot of stuff and involvement of folks over the years that came to a logical conclusion. It sounds like a quiet relief. Well, it was a relief because you can think you got everything under control, but that's why you plan and plan. You got somebody at the back door, you got an eye on this, you got somebody at the other house. Something could always go wrong. So it was a relief he was in custody for sure, but it wasn't unexpected. It was a relief it was over, 
But, you know, the next thing pops in your head. And in this job, there's always a next thing, either a next case or a next approach is, okay, we got him. Now we got to try to figure out if he was assisted by anybody. We're looking at additional harboring cases. We have to get search warrants. We have to get out there. We have to do an initial appearance. We have to do court appearances. Now there's a ton of work to do. You know, you catch a guy, you catch him. Fugitive case is over. You lock him up and put him away and let him go to court. This wasn't a case like that. This was a case where it's a big deal. You got a lot more to do and you better do it right. And Tommy, by this time, you're no longer working on the case. You've been sent back to New York. What are you feeling when you hear the news? I had known from talking to Phil that the public service announcement was going out that Monday or Tuesday and had been involved in helping to choose what photographs we were going to use on that. Matter of fact, I had interviewed two of the dental hygienists that work with Greg right around the time of our last photo. And they had also looked at the images and said, yeah, this is the best photo. This looks the most like her if you're trying to find them. I remember seeing the Wall Street Journal ad that Phil was talking about. And there was the photos that John Green and I had spent hours like putting together that facial view on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So that was kind of funny. I found out they got arrested by it. Literally, I had family staying at my house. It was my mother's 70th birthday party. We were at Chuck's Steakhouse in Danbury, Connecticut, and had gone home after the event and had woken up. One of my brothers was sleeping in the family room and about 5.30, 6 a.m. East Coast time, he yelled, hey, they just arrested Bolger in Santa Monica. And I looked at my BlackBerry and Phil had sent me a text saying both in custody. So that's kind of how I found out. I'm not going to lie. I was a little disappointed. I wasn't called to head out there and be a part of the interviews and the flight back home. Bureau doesn't always do the right thing, Jerry, right? What's that old saying? Possession is 90% of the law. And I just didn't happen to be in Boston when the arrest was made. That is what it is, you know, but it was certainly a great feeling to know that the FBI had finished this case. How long does this continue, Phil? Do you continue working on this case, trying to get all of these loose threads settled? Yeah, I continued pretty close to when I retire, which is in March of 2013. Right away, we had meetings with the U.S. Attorney's Office. We went out to L.A. two or three times. And eventually, it slowed down for me. I was getting close to retirement. I was working with the Massachusetts State Troopers, Curtis Sinelli, on the Bolger case and on other fugitive cases. After we caught him, for a while, it was all Bolger and all Bolger prosecution Eventually, it turned to working with the state police on fugitive matters and looking at this other case, which is that Donald Eugene Webb case. I took the files out, reviewed them, and went back to work on that and eventually turned it over to McDonald after I retired, who did the late work to identify and locate Webb in his wife's backyard in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. It changed a little bit, but there was a lot to do initially after we caught Bolger. All right. So all of that happens. Does he go to court? Does he plead guilty? What was his sentence? And then, of course, there was a truly dramatic conclusion to the Whitey Bolger case once he got to prison. We'll go back to court. So we fly out there. We get out there that morning. We have an initial appearance out in Los Angeles court with Scott Gariola, myself, Tian, and Neil Sullivan from the Marshals were out there. It's for both Bolger and Greg. They waive extradition. They elect to come back to Boston. So we fly back with him. We get the opportunity to talk. I do the interview with Bulger for the whole way back. We're on the FBI director's jet, which had flown out to pick us up. We'd flown commercial out there, but it flew out to pick us up. And we have four, five, six hours to talk to him. It was a long interview. Wish we had had more time. He's one of these guys that he only talks about what he wants to talk about. It's not like he was some drug addled heroin addict who robbed banks or was coming down or whatever. He had a motivation, wanted to talk about certain things. He talked about how he got some of his false identification. That was interesting and fascinating, but he wouldn't talk about a lot of the murders. He wouldn't talk about people that had helped him out. And there was nothing he could do except try to get him to talk about those things. And he elected not to in a lot of cases. He was loyal to certain people and didn't want to go there. What he did do was talk about his life on the run. And one of the things he did was during the period of time that he took this trip pre-fugitive with Teresa Stanley, he went all over the country. He went to Venice Beach and Santa Monica, California during that time. He never made any purchases there. Now, in other places he went, Bisbee, Arizona, places in Tennessee, Grand Isle, Louisiana, he put down some roots. 
He made purchases at different places under that Baxter ID. He never made any purchases in Santa Monica or Venice Beach. He traveled to the Pacific Northwest, said he didn't like it. It was too damp. Really, in his mind, he said he liked Santa Monica. Venice Beach was a little different, but he liked Santa Monica because there was a lot of older people there. He thought he could blend in. People kept to themselves. You could walk places. People weren't busybodies, and there was a large aging population in that area. When he got to that area, probably in 1986, or maybe it was early 87, he immediately began to target homeless people. That was the other thing he talked about, why he stayed in Santa Monica. There was a lot of white, older homeless people that he sort of connected with, and he started talking to these people. Eventually, he got to know some of these people, and not only for him, but for Kath and Greg, they paid people good money. They bought people items, including luggage, alcohol, in exchange for false identification. He's targeting homeless people in Santa Monica for false identification, and he's not targeting it just for their names, dates of birth, and socials. He's using that for sure, but this is how he thinks. And he told me that. He said he was wise to computers. He was wise to facial recognition. He didn't go in libraries. He didn't generally get on the internet often. And he didn't use any state ID or any official government ID where he put his own face on it. What he would do in one case in particular, a homeless individual who is an alcoholic, he tried to get him to quit drinking, but he got his ID. And what he did is he got some background on the guy, figured out where he was from. They had a lot in common. Eventually got this guy's driver's license. And instead of putting his face on the driver's license or getting a driver's license renewed with Bolger's own picture, he grew a beard and got some glasses and made himself look like the homeless guy whose driver's license he had obtained. Wow. And that's one example. There's other examples. That's the way this guy was thinking. He actually put this guy up, got him an apartment, put him up for a while, had him renew his driver's license on several occasions, had him get a vehicle in his name and give the vehicle to Bolger. Eventually, Catherine Gregg determined they didn't hear from the guy for a while. They were worried. Catherine Gregg made a call or did some snooping around, determined that the guy had died. Bolger had gotten somewhat close to this man, according to Bolger, and he knew it was a problem because the guy was collecting various government benefits. Now he was dead. Bolger said when he learned that had happened, he took the car that was registered to this individual, drove it toward the area where he had gotten an apartment with this individual, took the keys, threw it inside the car, got a bottle of some kind of liquor, spilled it around in there a little bit left the keys, walked away, and never drove again in Santa Monica. Covering his tracks in that way, which most people don't do that kind of stuff. They make mistakes. He didn't make a lot of mistakes while he was on the run. One thing Bolger told me on the flight back also, he said it was difficult to maintain his criminal edge after all those years. He said, if I had been on top of my game, I never would have come down in the basement and been arrested by Gary Ola down there. Some family members, his brother got jammed up because of that. But he said, after my brother got in trouble, I didn't want you guys to find me. I would have gone down in a mine shaft and died if I had gotten sick just because I didn't want law enforcement to find me. He was pissed off at law enforcement because what he said about the things that had happened to his brother. He also said, and I don't know if it's true or not, but if it's true, it was a good practice, which most fugitives don't do. He said, after my brother got in trouble and other people for the harboring and that kind of thing, I did not contact anybody from the homeland back in the Boston area or anybody I knew because I didn't want to put anybody else in the position of having to lie to law enforcement. Well, let me ask you a question then about Catherine Gregg, because we talked about her twin sister and how close that bond is. Did she ever reach out to her family? Not after the fugitive status, not as far as we know. Mac, what do you know the answer to that? Did she get jammed up too? I'm not aware of any information that speaks to the two fugitives being in touch with any of their family members or yeah, anyone but, back in Boston. Well, there's some early on with the phone calls. Yeah, we talked about that and, and the early contact, but after that, I'm not aware of any information that there was contact. And yeah. I think Phil Steary's right. And I think that's what Bolger said to him was after what happened to his brother, his brother getting arrested and charged, he decided to cut ties with the family. 
Let me ask you about Catherine when it comes to her being arrested. You're talking about escorting Waddy Bolger on the plane and interviewing him as you return to Boston. What's going on with Catherine? Because you have a, an arrest warrant for her, too. Is she on that same flight? Yes, she's on the same flight. She gets an initial appearance at the same time as Bolger. She's interviewed to some extent, but does not provide a lot of information. And honestly, that's probably one of the mistakes we made here. We should have done some more attempts at interviewing her, but uh, there's not a lot of information gained from her or really information gained from him pertaining to past crimes. Eventually, they both go to court. Bolger's convicted and they both go to court and they Bolger does life in prison and she does a significant amount of time. He always needed a female to be with him. He told me that on the plane as well. He said, Catherine kept me out of trouble. He had a violent temper. He needed somebody to do day-to-day -day business, prescriptions, go to the store. He was not comfortable going out without her. He needed that. He needed the female. It's probably he needed her for some things. But on the other hand, the pictures of her helped get him caught. Yeah, he talked about some fights he had been in overseas and things like that. He said his temper was controlled by Catherine, and that helped him keep out of trouble and not get caught. For all of her support of him, how many years did she get? Catherine Gregg, who was Bolger's accomplice and with him when he got caught, ended up being sentenced to eight years in prison on the harboring charge. Usually, my experience in these harboring fugitive cases might be a year or two. She did much more than that. She received additional time after that for refusing to testify for the grand jury. Ah, that's a real loyal girlfriend. I hope he was worth it for her. Before we talk about the dramatic conclusion for Bolger, I just wanted to clarify because the initial charge you mentioned from DEA and from Massachusetts State Police, is that what he's going to court for? Is that what he's convicted of? You know, I was going to back up there because I think early on I said the initial charge, January 5th, 1995, Bulger and Fleming charged for extortion of bookmakers and drug dealers. I think that's the accurate statement for extortion of bookmakers and drug dealers. I believe that was the DEA and the state police. Am I right there, Mac? I guess I'm not real clear on some of that. I know the superseding indictment was wanted by the FBI, and he was wanted by the FBI both for the initial indictment and the superseding indictment. But who wanted who, what, when? I'd have to research that a little bit to speak. The superseding indictment was for the 19 murders? Yes. Okay. I'm clear now. Yeah. To be accurate on that, I guess I'm not real comfortable with dates and times and places. There's other people that did all that work. So I guess I'd like to at least get a fact check. Generally, the initial indictment in 1994 for which he fled town was extortion, bookmaking, that type of thing, shakedowns. The superseding indictment, which came a few years later, was where the murders were charged. Both those investigations, the FBI, to my knowledge, was not involved in. That was DEA and state police. And if you think about it, what happened was they rolled the guys they arrested on the initial indictment, Stephen Flemmy, Kevin Weeks. They cooperated with DEA, state police, and that's how they built the RICO indictment against Bolger. So the only thing the FBI was looking at Bolger for was this fugitive investigation. The original UFAP investigation related, associated with the initial DEA and state police indictments. Yeah, that's correct. I'm not aware of the FBI being involved in the substantive case in Boston that gave rise to those federal charges. It wasn't our case. The oh, fugitive no. part was. You're talking about the initial indictment. I honestly don't think we were involved in the superseding. Would they have let us in on that? I'm looking at the later I.O., the one in 2000, where it's RICO, wanted by the FBI, and that's in 2000, which when the superseding indictment was. Is he wanted by the FBI for UFAP or for the RICO? The I.O., the identification order, says RICO, with all the other stuff that comes after it. It says RICO-murder, 18 counts, conspiracy, all that stuff. He's wanted for bank robbery, but we're only in it because of the fugitive investigation. Yeah, those were the charges, but the case, the investigators that got those charges were not FBI agents. They were DEA agents and state well, troopers. Well, here's a that question. Were. When he was in court and when he went sent to prison, 
who was involved in that not prosecution? The F- not the FBI. It was, okay. uh, I mean, we obviously turned over everything we had, but the case agents were going to be the troopers and DEA. If this yeah. case happened nowadays, it would have went right to the marshals. The FBI wouldn't have been involved. If it was an FBI informant, the U.S. Attorney's Office, they would have gotten charges, and I can almost guarantee it would have given it to the marshals. Interesting. The troopers and the DA did a great job putting a lot of this together originally, just because they should be you know, cited for that, for sure. All I'm right. just not sure there's a UFAP on him, honestly. No, I don't think there was. An inter- oh, interesting. really? How did you work the case? <laughs> well, because it was classified as a 281E subfile fugitive. So it was classified under an organized crime investigation. And Greg was charged with a harboring charge. So that was the FBI's case. The harboring case was the FBI's. We took that through her guilty plea. But the RICO indictment, that was all two other agencies. We were just charged with finding him. That was the agreement worked out. And it was weird for me because I 95% of my warrants were UFAPs. This wasn't a different world. Okay. There was no UFAP warrant. We do know he was sent to prison and we learned that he was actually killed by some of the inmates in prison. And I know that's still an ongoing investigation as to who was involved in the killing and how it occurred. But it is certainly a conclusion to this case that makes it even more interesting than it was. So I have a few more questions, if you don't mind, about the movies that have been produced about this. We've already mentioned Black Mass and The Departed. And I guess The Departed was fictionalized. It wasn't really about Whitey Bulger, but Black Mass certainly was. Have either of you seen that movie? I saw it. I read the book too. Like Mac, I didn't know much about the case till I was asked to come here. This is in the early 2000s. I read the book and it gave me a lot of background. I did see the movie and my personal commentary, it wasn't like a crime movie. It was more like a movie about the character of Bulger. And so I wasn't that interested. I guess I'll just leave it at that. Personally, it didn't interest me that much because it was a more character movie than a crime movie. I guess that's because that's what I did for a long time was fight crime. Been there, done that. Yeah. And what about you, Tommy? What did you think of the movie? I read both Black Mass and Brothers Bolger, which was written by Howie Carr. But that was all before I came to Boston to work the case. And I did not see the Johnny Depp movie, Black Mass. I did see The Departed, but didn't think much of it. But I did not see the most recent movie, Black Mass. What I like to do sometimes is to look at a movie, whether it's crime fiction or it's based on a true FBI case and kind of break down the accuracy as far as FBI policy and procedure. But I guess we can't do that for either of these movies because it doesn't sound like they were about the actual FBI case. Well, this has been fantastic talking to you both. And I know, Tommy, the last time we spoke, I asked you when and why you joined the FBI. And I hope people will go back to that episode and check that out. Now it's Phil's turn to kind of tell us when and why he joined the FBI. My first job right out of college was as a park ranger for the National Park Service in Everglades National Park pretty quickly after graduation. And there was a body, a shooting victim found in the park, which is a federal violation on government property. The FBI drove up from Homestead, Florida. They couldn't really find the body because it was out in the middle of nowhere. I found the agent, blue lighting up and down Highway 41, brought him back to the body location, got to know him, and they solved the case within a couple of weeks. So I got to know these guys to some extent, and it gave me an interest in the FBI, and I eventually applied. I had previous federal law enforcement experience, and I enjoyed every minute of it, and I still miss it. After you retired, I hear you didn't miss it for long. After retirement, I went back to Afghanistan for about a year working for SIGAR, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. I then came back from Afghanistan and I started working on an old case that I had worked on in 1989, a tragic abduction and homicide of a 10-year-old victim outside of Cleveland, Ohio. So I was there the day after it happened, working on it with numerous other agents. And eventually a prosecutor from Cleveland, the Bay Village Police Department and other law enforcement agencies in Cleveland have brought me back to continue working on that case. We're working on it all the time. It never goes away. A lot of it's DNA work now, but we're trying to figure it out and bring that case to a logical conclusion as well. 
It's a part-time job, but it's a good mission in life. Yeah, and it keeps you connected to those glory days. Right. I still know people and still try to do the right thing when I can. I like to give my guest the last word. I'm going to have Tommy go first, and then Phil, if you could leave us with your wise words of wisdom. Jerry, as an agent, I worked just about a decade in New York City alongside some senior first grade detectives with the NYPD. And then I spent another just about a decade of my career working in the state of Maine, where I worked oftentimes with small town detectives, even a sheriff's deputy that was assigned to Vinyl Haven, which is one of the largest islands off the coast of Maine. It's a good perspective to have as an agent. One thing I learned is no matter who you work with or where you work, results speak for itself. The Bolger case was a crucial case for the FBI to be at the controls of when we figured it out. And I know that we would not have been good for the FBI if Bolger had been located in his Santa Monica apartment dead of natural causes, or if he'd been apprehended like Eric Rudolph on a patrol stop. To me, this case was finally resolved by the work done in the place where the FBI received its most criticism, right in Boston. And we did a lot more than just disseminate a photograph to the media. And the work led to results, and the results speak for themselves. Bill? Two points, I guess. And one is, I know McDonald agrees with me on this, is in law enforcement, knocking on doors is always the best, most sophisticated technique. It works all the time. And the second thing, and it goes along with that, is there's never a time you can say there's nothing else to do. There's always something else to do, be it another case or working on another case. And that goes back to once we caught Bolger, one of the things in my mind right away was catching Donald Eugene Webb or figuring out what happened to him. Luckily, I worked with McDonald and he could bring that case to a logical conclusion. I I sort of helped resurrect it, I think, and push it along, but McDonald figured it out. It's all about who you work with and good people. And that's the end of part two of this two-part case review. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes where you'll find a photo of Phil Torsney and Tommy McDonald, Bolger's top 10 one-it poster, and other photos, links to articles and videos about the Whitey Bolger fugitive case, including that FBI PSA targeting Catherine Gregg, and an interview on the CBS show 60 Minutes about the capture of Bolger featuring Phil Torsney, Tommy McDonald, and Scott Gariola. There's also a link to Tommy McDonald's case review about Donald Eugene Webb, the other fugitive case he and Phil worked on together. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, Once a month, via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist, where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.